Okay, um, we're going to get started. People are going to be starting the trickle in. So, uh, again, thank you again for coming. Uh, we will also want to thank Vision and Voices uh, from USC's Humanities Initiative for sponsoring this talk and uh, really um, making room for us to really have this honest dialogue about South LA and USC community issues as well. Um, also want to thank uh, co-organizers uh, Allison Trope and Taj Fraser from the professors from uh, the USC Annenberg School for their great work. And um, also uh, the Annenberg School's facilities and technology crew for everything that they're doing in terms of setting up uh, the room and also the reception tonight. And also Intersection South LA again, uh, the South LA report, and, and thank them for uh, not only attending the event and helping us cover the event, but also, again, uh, they will continue to have stories um, on Intersections, the website, and also have different uh, stories that come out of this event and tie this event to the spring events that we have coming up on February 26th, again, and also March 7th, the, the walking tour. Um, so uh, as, we get, as we get started, I also uh, want uh, to really point out, again, besides the map uh, and the reception, you also have a chance to kind of reflect on this talk and the reception uh, and the this discussion that we have today and really talk about what you feel your South LA is uh, and how it's connected to either the USC community and also the, the general community of South LA as well. So we encourage you to also participate in that. And you'll have some people uh, taking pictures of you as well uh, as you, as you um, actually fill out some of those cards. So uh, as you're eating Earl's Grill, please uh, uh, take pictures as well. So um, again, uh, we really uh, have three goals for this uh, meeting today and this discussion. We really wanted to give some history about South LA and really place USC not only in, in terms of its uh, geographic position within uh, the north part of South Central LA, but also put in, uh, place it in the broader context of South LA, the region, and, and really remember that South LA really uh, takes up a large uh, region, and not just the immediate South Central area near USC, but it goes very down far south in terms of its imaginary to um, some of the southern cities, such as Gardena and Compton as, as well, in addition to the other neighborhoods such as Watts and other, uh, other parts that kind of border around the L Los Angeles County and also the city uh, as Los Angeles City. So we wanted to have a discussion about that too. We also uh, wanted to point out um, that there's a lot of great community work and civic action work going on in South LA and we have some, uh, some great panelists to talk about that today and, and really talk about uh, some of the great work that's happening. And uh, lastly, we also want to kind of pose the question of, uh, given all, a lot of the stuff that's been happening around the USC campus, given, uh, given its expansion and giving, uh, given its development, and also given some of the, the, the public safety and community uh, issues and the neighborhood change issues taking place, we wanted to uh, have an honest discussion about how South LA and, and USC uh, can be better neighbors and, and what are some, some ideas about that. And, and how we can actually sustain some long-term engagement um, as, as South LA be, uh, continues to grow as an as a area. So um, those are some of our goals, and there's some great examples, such as the Unidad Coalition and the Coalition of Organizations that really worked with and led a lot of those efforts um, with USC to kind of guarantee, uh, to create community benefits around some of those developments. So we also wanted to discuss that and, and have that um, on point as well. So. Um, so tonight we're, gonna, we're also gonna, we're gonna hear from Francisco Ortega, who's with the Los Angeles City Human Relations Commission, who really, spawned, uh, who really creates some of these dialogues in South LA and really talk about uh, the commission and its history um, and, and its growth and, and his perspectives about South LA. Also Alberto Retana from Community Coalition, uh, long-term uh, community organ. Yeah, he deserves to as well. <laughs> Um, Al Alberto Rattana, I, I, I met him actually 12 years ago when he had lots of hair, so it, it's great to actually, uh, um, um, it's, it, no, well, we're old, <laughs> maybe, That's a, no, wait, kind of young but old, but uh, anyway, so, so it was very, yeah, as he said, very puffy, so, so it's, it's, it's great to have him on the panel as well, and Community Coalition, again, um, a great organization that does not only youth organizing, but a lot of working on a lot of the structural inequity in the area as well. <laughs> 
So we'll also hear from Aaron Aubrey Kaplan, who's been a long-term chronicler of um, African-American political, economic, and cultural issues in the area. And I really love uh, reading her articles on the LA Times and KCT. And um, really, a lot of her stuff has been really great. And also Saris Suleiman, uh, uh, who I uh, normally meet on, on the bike path. So uh, it's, a, it's great to have her. She, she's the, yeah, the South, LA Boyle, uh, South LA and Boyle Heights uh, beat writer for Streets Blog LA. And she, uh, and she also works with a lot of the youth in South LA to really um, create opportunities uh, for their growth as well and, uh, and trying to make our streets much more publicly safe as well. So um, I, I'm, I think I've reminded everybody of everything that we're doing. Uh, so we're going to hand it off first. Uh, actually, just a quick poll. How many, how many of you all are here as USC students or faculty? First staff. Ooh. Great. OK. Great. And how many of you all are here as, as uh, uh, South LA residents, businesses, or community organizations? Great. And just the last question, how, how many of you feel a part of South LA as an area? Great. OK. Great. And, and this is a great, uh, great discussion. So I'm going to hand it off first to uh, Francisco, who will talk about uh, some of his views and some of his perspectives. So you got to keep time. You got to keep time. Yes. Right. Because yeah. I just I drone on forever. So first, I'll thank you. Me. I know you'll tap me. There will be some tapping. Thank you uh, all for coming. And uh, thank you for having us and having me as a panelist. Uh, I think this is a very important conversation to have. Uh, it's a, not only an important conversation, I think it's a necessary conversation to have about uh, this region of our city and also how this region um, is also uh, in, uh, in connected to other parts of, of Southern California and, and Los Angeles, greater Los Angeles. Uh, Francisco Ortega, I've been with the uh, Human Relations Commission and working for the city uh, for almost 10 years. and. Um, uh, was hired uh, as a, a human relations advocate uh, to the city and uh, slowly s sort of learned uh, that my work wasn't going to happen in the valley as I, I thought and it wasn't going to happen with immigra immigration as I initially thought and was hired to do but that I would be coming to South Los Angeles and start, start the work of building um, at least platforms for uh, civic engagement, opportunities for uh, some of South LA's most, I think, challenged communities when it comes to public safety, infrastructure, um, you know, you, we can name uh, the gamut in terms of that. Um, I, the commission, and it, a lot of you go, what is a human, like, often when we go to places, and one, I want to acknowledge one of our commissioners who sits on the board of commissioners just here, uh, Narinian Kalsa, he's right over here, and um, often when we go places and, and we're asked, you know, who we are and what we're doing there, and uh, people always think we're human resources, as in we're not human resources. Uh, so we're, we're human relations, and, and in fact, human relations was born out of uh, the 1965 watts, as we could, call it whatever, right, uprising, civil unrest, you know, to be perfectly politically correct, you know, uh, civil unrest seems like, uh, like kind of not the way to describe what happened in 65, right? But uh, certainly the commission uh, is born uh, in 68 uh, out of that strife. Uh, and, and just a, a note of that, right, what, what, cat what the catalyst was for that, for that, um, uh, um, that explosive a few days where I think 34 people lost their lives uh, was a police stop. Okay, so, so we, we have a history here, right? And so ultimately that's where I'm headed, right? The commission uh, for a long time was inactive. Uh, like a lot of city departments, um, it wasn't properly funded and properly staffed. Um, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm a small city department, so I often, you know, I, I boo-hoo the big departments who get all the lion's share of what they what they get. But uh, but we're we're an, uh, uh, an organization that cares deeply about civic engagement, number one, and number two, care deeply about the status of intergroup dynamics throughout the city. So uh, wherever we see that there's a potential flashpoint, uh, wherever we see that there's a, a potential for, for uh, confrontation, uh, then we engage communities in trying to create opportunities to, to dialogue and to create uh, a way out or a way forward, um, a, a, as it were. So 
uh, born of that in the 90s. Uh, of course, you know, 92 happened, and I think the, the Mayor Reardon, if you all remember him, he's aging, but he's, still, he was, he's around then, and he said, let's, let's put some money behind this, this organization. So we grew, the commission grew quite a bit, uh, new commissioners were on, um, and then by, by 92 happened, by 2000, there was a more robust staff. 2008 happened. And 2008, as you know, uh, devastated the city, devastated the country uh, economically. And so, again, there's always these cuts. And whoever, you know, the, the, the people who to go first in cuts are small little departments like ours. So we, we cease being a, a department uh, with the staff, at the executive director. With the, we still have an executive director, but we cease being that staff, um, that bigger staff that we had. We had over 20 people at some point. Now we only have four people that, you know, for a city that has four plus million residents. So, okay, the history of the commission is that. We, should we wrap it up? Is this what we, uh, five seconds? seconds? Ten seconds. So, given the, the whole history of that, we continue to, to, to engage communities. Uh, and South LA has been my work with community police relations. So that's really been the, the big thing, is how to bridge the community and their dissatisfaction with how law enforcement polices their communities and then bridging that gap and creating long-term solutions for that. So when we get back around, um, I'm going to talk more about, about community police relations and how we can strengthen those. Great. Yeah, all right. Uh, good, uh, good evening. I, um, one, uh, anybody watch Dave Chappelle? Uh, sometimes I wish we had the wrap it up B section uh, to flash on the screen to sort of move us along, but uh, I wasn't able to get that together, so we will not do the Dave Chappelle. Uh, but I am very excited to be on this panel with such a distinguished group of folks and here with you. Uh, and one of the reasons why I'm here to do this is because there is a huge need to get folks involved in the movement for social justice. And there's got to be multiple on-ramps for different people to get engaged. And if anything, my goal here for the students at, UC at USC, I almost did a slip. <laughs> wow. <from> UCLA. <laughs> uh, to on-ramp you into the movement. And so that, that's hopefully what, uh, what we can do, because uh, it's absolutely necessary if we're going to really bring about the kind of massive social transformation we, we seek to accomplish at Community Coalition. Uh, I wanted to show a map real quick. You all have a map. But one thing that I always find interesting about Los Angeles and for tourists that come is there's always these beautiful sightseeing maps of Beverly Hills and uh, Hollywood and the Kodak Theater. There's a little bit of love for Olvera Street, sort of signaling a little bit of, but not really Ball Heights, but kind of Ball Heights. Downtown, this is a little nifty, I don't know what that is by Rodeo, you know, pretty woman. Uh, UC, well, I don't want to mention UCLA, but even UCLA makes it. Uh, where, what, what's up with that, right? So this is one map. Uh, and I, I could have put a ton of them. Here's another one of Los Angeles. You know, the beach cities, the port, Hermosa. This is whole set. LAX is like all of South LA for some reason. <laughs> but it's just gone. It's not a place to visit. And even, uh, even the map that you got, uh, that we handed out, uh, certainly has some spots. You know, Central Avenue, there's, I don't even know if West Adams is in there, uh, the Watts Towers, there's so much richness in culture. All up and down Western Avenue, there's Restaurant Row of international restaurants from Belize, Honduras, uh, from Ethiopia. I mean, it's just, there's so much to offer that you never see about South LA. But why? Why is that the case? So I'm gonna try to, this is really not a real history lesson, this is more of a narrative. So think of this as a narrative, because if there's any historians in the room, you're gonna get into you know, nitpicky, and what about this one, no. So think of this as a narrative of South LA, certainly how we talk about community coalition and how we've arrived at today. Much like the rise in mass alcohol and tobacco consumption during the Great Depression, the crack epidemic followed a major economic crisis in South LA. One thing we have to ask ourselves is, after the Great Recession, have we found ourselves with the same kind of consumption of drugs and alcohol? And if not, did anything that the president did around the stimulus package look different? I don't know, something to think about. But we do know what happened here. Uh, in the 1960s, 
U.S. manufacturing companies began shutting their doors. Between 1978 and 1982, South Los Angeles lost 70,000 jobs. Here's 17 companies on the wall, U, uh, U.S. Motors, uh, Goodrich, Rockwell. A lot of people think of Detroit as Auto City. Actually, L.A. was Auto City. And a lot of the work that uh, Dr. Manuel Pastor, who's in the room, has chronicled the shifting changes in the economy as well as uh, the changes in demography. Uh, by 1989, 320 manufacturing plants shut down and over 124,000 people lost their jobs. What did the federal government do in the 80s to respond to the changing economy? Did they pass a stimulus package? Did they invest in health care? Did they invest in the social safety net? Yes or no? No. They did not. In fact, they cut away all those programs. President Reagan cut all of the shelters for homelessness. They went after welfare. They went after all of these public safety programs that people would have turned to otherwise. So what hits the street? What's this? It's a dime. Uh, it's crack cocaine. Uh, and crack cocaine hits the streets significantly at a time when people were desperate for success, de desperate for a job, desperate to, to get something better for themselves. And what we found ourselves doing in our community is self-medicating. And addiction being a real response to the economic crisis. And just to give you a, give a sense of what it means, uh, well, let's talk about the crackdown of crack. Who's this man right here? Gates. Chief Daryl Gates. That thing behind him right there is a big tank. And that tank used to roll down Vermont Avenue. How many of y'all that were around remember these tanks in Daryl Gates? This is a pretty scary scene, militarized community, uh, through a program called Operation Hammer, uh, and through a, a police unit called Crash that ends with street hoodlums. Uh, and this is the kind of response that President Reagan encouraged across the country. And in 1971, when President Nixon demanded a war on drugs, he pretty much laid out a war on poor people and decided that what they were going to do is treat addiction not as a public health problem, but as a criminal problem. So they began to do sentencing laws, treating crack addiction far worse than powder cocaine that we're beginning to reverse today. And what's the impact on people? Well, you do mass incarceration. You send people to prison. And if you're a mother with a child who gets a felony, your child is five times more likely to end up in the foster care system. So we talk about the school to prison pipeline. There is a foster care pipeline right into prison that goes back to the economy changing, the response by our federal government, and the response by our local law enforcement to crack down on people. Uh, 15 seconds. What is the result? <laughs> the U.S. leads the world. We're champions of America. We are, you know, yay, we're doing it. We're leading the world. We have a higher incarceration rate than China, Russia, Iran, all democratic republics. We are, in California, we've built 22 new prisons, spend 62,000 a year on each inmate, and our prison rate has grown five times since 1962. But the crime rate has remained the same. The impact, families torn apart, people don't feel safer, African Americans are criminalized, and South Central is characterized as a violent, unsafe place. We don't make it on the map. And for those of you that are wondering, why did he not put Latino up there? I did not put Latino up there on purpose. Not because Latinos are not criminalized. Clearly, Omar was shot by the police and killed. It's not, I'm not denying the fact that Latinos are characterized, but the very nature of this problem was about targeting African Americans, and I want to root our analysis in how that took place. So uh, I have a very positive story to tell a little bit later. I'm much more uplifting and excited about the kinds of changes we can make, but this is just a brief snapshot of South LA history. You're keeping it. And we're going to hear from Aaron uh, Aubrey Kaplan next. And just to remind you, um, we're also going to have a Q&A um, uh, right after the panel discussion, so uh, really kind of uh, have your questions ready as well. So, Aaron. Okay, thanks. Well, okay. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. It's good? Yeah. Okay, well, uh, let me know about the five minutes. Sure. Keep, keep me. Um, well, uh, I'll just talk a little bit about how I, how I came to do what I do. Back in 1992, which was the civil unrest, um, that followed 1965, 27 years after that, um, 
I, that's when I started writing about South, and I don't, I, it's hard for me to say South LA, that's not what it is to me, South Central. Because it has historic meaning, and, and to me, South LA was sort of like, I don't know, Kentucky Fried Chicken becoming KFC, and it didn't change anything. It just, it's just like marketing to me, and it makes people feel better, I guess, about South LA. But, but, but South Central's rooted in Central Avenue, which was historically the black, you know, hub of Los Angeles. So South LA sounds very generic to me, and I, you, you do talk about South Central within South LA. It's all just naming, you know, LA is weird that way. You know, suddenly you have North Hills and Panorama City disappears, and then, and then you have Compton Boulevard that gets erased from um, uh, Redondo Beach. You know, it's things like that happen. But anyway, so I'll just say South Central, know, know what I'm talking about. Um, so I started writing for the LA Times in 1992, very excited about, I mean, I mean, kind of distressed by the unrest, but excited about the possibility of covering South Central, because that was basically my job. The LA Times sort of had a, a media crisis in 1992. They weren't covering LA very well. It's a hard city to cover, um, even in good years. And when, you know, as someone mentioned, it's a huge area. Um, they were trying to round up reporters and send them out to South Central. Nobody wanted to go. You know, there was a crisis in the newsroom about this. So out of this came an effort. One of the efforts was a section I wrote for called City Times, which was kind of segregated from the main paper, which was its f the first mistake. But we had an office, actually, right down on, on, on Flower and Exposition. There was nothing there back then, believe it or not. It was just very close to USC. I could walk here. And, and so, um, uh, you know, centrally located. And so um, my job was to cover the Southwest LA, which was Crenshaw in that area. And it's funny, you know, the profile that Alberto showed us, very interesting. There's a lot of in between in that, in that, you know, there are a lot of middle class people. Well, now I don't know what middle class means anymore. That's a whole other discussion. We'll get to that. Um, very different ec economic picture now. But um, so I was on a mission. I thought the revolution had come. You know, I was going to, we were going to, I was going to, I saw myself as just as a reporter, but also kind of filling the narrative gap, the stories we don't tell, the, the, just writing about the life of South Central that, uh, that maybe might put it on a map, or at least a psychological map. Because truly, you know, we all know, you know, let's not be shy, you know, South Central is a place people just drive through. They're not gonna stop there. I knew people didn't go south of the 10 freeway. You might be one of them. They never went east of the 110, and that started to include other black people who were making it, making, going out of the neighborhood, which just, you know, left this desolate, wasteland called South Central. And I think people still think that, frankly. I, I know we've done a lot of PR efforts. I know why we're here to talk about partnership. But that's how people think. I live in Inglewood. Nobody visits me. <laughs> because in a way, uh, except my family, they're here, you know. Um, because people think of Ingl Inglewood. Uh, you said what? Inglewood. It's all the same place in people's minds. It's a place of black people and then Latino people. It's a place you don't go. I don't know that we've gotten over that. In fact, I would say it's probably more entrenched now than it was when I started writing. In 92, because what, what, what really I thought would happen in 92, what hasn't happened, is South Central has not changed economically. So the problem, so 20 years later, I was driving here from Inglewood and I thought, I'm just marveling at how much uh, USC has done in the area. As a friend of mine said, well, USC is just, the buffer's getting bigger. The buffer's getting bigger between USC and the hood. And at some point you go outside the buffer, uh-oh, you still have the same problem, the public safety issues and all that. But all this gets back to the economic picture, which really I thought was gonna be the revolution, but, and it was tied to the police issue, of course, and the, the people were really expressing, mostly black, black people, but a lot of other people, expressing the inequality, that sound familiar? The inequality, which is tied to race, and that was, I think, in 1992, might have been the last time nationally we were looking at, what is this that these black people are protesting? What do they want? It was a big picture moment. I don't think we've had that moment since then. Of course, in the meantime, you know, after that, journalism fell apart, media shrank. The LA Times is half the size it was in 1992. It is rents out the other half of the building, if it can. So you have far less coverage of anything. I was telling Willa, who's here, in, uh, intersections, if it weren't for intersections, nobody would be covering a lot of these stories in South Central. And that's, that's crazy, because our paper doesn't do it. So, that is a huge problem. Yeah, let's move on to someone who does cover it. Yeah, okay. Thank you again. Hey, thank you. Okay. Well, yeah, you do, but I'm, I'm talking, just, I mean. I know, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. No, she's right, she's absolutely right. Is this on? Yes, okay. Um, so my name's Sara Saliman, and speaking of cocaine, um, I, uh, I was actually a graduate student here for, 
way too many years, um, like a decade, uh, working on a PhD uh, that, I, that I neglected to finish. Um, <laughs> I know. Um, I'm smart, though, really. And, uh, but I'm, the first trip that I took, I was in the International, Relati International Relations Department, and the first trip I took was to Colombia to investigate the drug war. And um, I had, I arrived and I had probably been there uh, no more than a day or two. And this guy gets up in my face and he's like, what are you doing here? Who do you think you are? How arrogant are you to come to our country? You know, you who perpetuate these terrible policies that actually keep the war alive in our country. Because this was in 2001 when the drug war was really at its height and Colombia was supplying 90% of the cocaine that was coming into the States, was, was, I think, to the world, was coming out of Colombia at the time. Um, and he was like, how, how dare you come here thinking you know the answer to our problems, you know our problems better than we do, and go home and stop taking cocaine. <laughs> well, you know, for the record, I've never done cocaine. Um, but it, it's, it, was, it was an accusation and it was a uh, confrontation that stayed with me throughout all of my graduate career and throughout the work that I do now, which is you really have to respect the folks that are, you ha there's two things. One is that you have to respect the knowledge of the people in a community, who they are, what they represent, what they've been through. They do know their problems pretty well they, and they also know and are more aware than anyone else that the root causes of those problems, they might manifest in the community, but as Alberto's talking about, these guys are talking about, it's, the root causes are, are much more complex and they, they, they're, they're structural, they're political, they come from a whole range, a complex web of, of things, and you have to be able to peel back those layers and understand that you may have gang issues in Watts, you may have these different things that you see that give you these ideas about South LA, but the, actually the reason that those things are the way they are, those, the sources of those problems are, are elsewhere. They do fester and grow because of the, the disinvestment and the disenfranchisement, whatever it might be. Um, but the, you have to look for those sources elsewhere. So how does that fit into what I do at Streets Blog? I, uh, after like a decade here, um, I, I decided I wanted to take everything that I had learned looking at what I categorized um, while I was here as transnational and tragic. So I studied genocide, I studied drug trafficking, I studied sex trafficking, human trafficking, forced migration, and all of the international aid responses offered to those, to, as solutions to those problems and, and studied the reasons why they didn't work. Um, I spent a lot of time traipsing around villages in remote locations asking folks if aid had arrived, what form it arrived in, what did they need? Um, and it was really, it was what I think what I really learned from was hearing how the disconnect between what, how they viewed themselves, uh, what they understood as their needs, uh, what they were offered, and versus the, the aid organizations, um, how they viewed these communities, how they viewed what they need, um, and what they viewed successes. And th those disconnects are tremendous and they explain a lot of why aid doesn't work so well. Um, uh, I have really bad news for you, most of the aid, the billions of dollars that I saw going into Africa when I was traipsing around Malawi, they really didn't do a whole lot. So um, it's unfortunate, but the same dynamic is actually alive and well in South LA where you have a really tremendous disconnect between the community and what they need, how they see themselves, um, the root causes, uh, the, real, the social issues, and the, the responses that the city is, is necessarily willing to offer. Thank God we have folks like Francisco in there that, that keep you know, in the mayor's ear saying, no, that's not right, can't, <laughs> can't do things that way. Um, doesn't mean that things always go the way that he would like, but, but we need more voices like that that help to bring up those community voices and help people understand what the lay of the land is, what, who's out there, what are their needs. So a lot of what I do as a community journalist, she's talking about you know, journalism taking a dive and, and it's allowed for new forms of journalism to come up and I've been really fortunate to be one of those. I, I do community-based journalism, so about 75% of my time I think I spend um, really working with organizations. Um, I know the youth that are in Community Coalition, they're amazing what, what they do with youth. Um, I volunteer with different groups. I network with them, go on bike rides. Um, 
but I'm always trying to help connect them with the city, connect them with the right people, connect them with each other so that there is more communication, so that these voices do become stronger and that we do learn more about South LA as its own, as, as it sees itself as opposed to the way that everybody else's ideas are imposed upon it. I think that's a good segue into um, highlighting some of the great civic action work that's actually taking place. And I know um, everyone's going to talk about some of the work and some of the organizations, but maybe we can start talking also about what you see as some of the existing kind of assets in the community and some of the organizations that are really contributing to kind of create a better South LA. And, and what are some of your perspectives on that? And start maybe with Francisco. I, I, I think you know, just even Coco, I mean, just hearing, hearing uh, Roberto talk, uh, it, it's, it's um, they're, they're, they're one of those flagship organizations in the area that, are, that is doing a lot of good work. But I think um, there's tremendous amount, I think to take your point, there's tremendous amount of resources coming to Los Angeles, to South LA. Um, but, but there's, um, there's a disconnect between um, sort of the, the the resources and the targeted the target and what we're what we're hoping to achieve with those resources or why. So it's sort of like uh, like uh, throwing money at a problem instead of throwing uh, it's really sort of ground from the ground up engagement with people partnering with people in a in a way that 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 we haven't before. And um, I think just in hearing uh, Alberto's uh, initial presentation, you get a sense that um, that even South LA as South LA is different in every facet of, of South LA. Uh, you, you heard Aaron talk about South Central and that, that corridor, that central corridor. I mean, I spend a lot of time in Watts, and Watts to me is a, is a whole different, right, a whole different world in, the, in a way of how we conceive or imagine South Los Angeles. And then I've also spent time in Wilmington. No one even thinks of Wilmington as south, right? But it's, it, it's down south, it's, right? But it's a south LA, right? Um, and then you think of this area here, this area, right, as we talked about the, the hub. And who's here? What are we doing? So there's a, there's a lot of stuff that's going on. Uh, Faith-based uh, initiatives. Um, there's, there's a lot of more nonprofits probably in this sector of the world than, than you can uh, imagine, right? But can Continually, we see the same sort of patterns of behavior that happen here. Our work, as I said earlier, is centered around uh, creating uh, collabor collaboration, uh, civic engagement between sort of the city and and uh, and, and institutions like the LAPD. Um, uh, the LAPD has a, a checkered past in South LA. To, uh, to, to say that right, but 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 what what has happened here in the last 15 to 20 years uh, with the Los Angeles Police Department is that it has been uh, uh, going through an internal uh, in, internal change, and and that internal change is is really understanding how to partner differently with this community and and understanding that uh, that 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 Daryl Gates legacy is always front and center for a lot of uh, residents who live in this area that that is their that is their point of reference to how how the LAPD has policed this area in the last 20 20 years and that's a, yeah okay. and, uh, and maybe Alberto you could talk a little bit more about some of those uh, responses that the community has in terms of responding to some of the LAPD stuff and, and the work of your organization as well? Okay, um, one, let me say that COCO was certainly a great opportunity for civic action, but, and I want everybody to become an organizer, a community coalition, but I hope that what this panel demonstrates is that you can be a writer, you can be a reporter, you can work in government, and all contribute to creating change. And so this is the kind of multiple on-ramps I'm talking about, but, I encourage you to become organizers and come work at Community Coalition, and let me tell you why. Uh, one, a couple back step, steps around values. This is calling to question, what are your values? What are you putting forth? Do you believe that this is an issue of pathology and bad individual choices and behaviors, or ecology and the social and economic conditions in a community? It's a, it goes back in history, but you have to ask ourselves, where do you orient yourself? Because when my car gets broken into, or when I have a family member who's a victim of crime, I quickly jump to the pathology narrative. Even though 
Theoretically speaking, and in my heart of hearts, I'm all about social and economic conditions. So you have to root yourself in those values and surround yourselves around those values. So are you looking at this as a pathology or ecology? Number two, are you looking at this as disparity or equity? If you look at disparity, which I think is important, but disparity just means that there's a difference. There's no power equation. There's no justice involved in disparity. It just acknowledges, well, well, there's one neighborhood that's one way and another, way, another neighborhood that's another. But if you think about equity, at the very core of equity is justice. And the very core of justice is a balance of scales and who's winning out over who's not. And equity has got to be a theme that we think about in driving change. And when I think about South Los Angeles and all of us in this room, I fundamentally believe that it requires uh, communities like South, LA, South Los Angeles to be an anchor of progressive change in regions like Los Angeles if we really want to accomplish our mission of making sure equity and equality is available to all people. So disparity and equity. And the last thing I would put on the table around values is are we building a movement or are we just contributing to charity? And charity is great, don't get me wrong, but hearing Sarah's stories of all this aid that's going to Africa or aid or resources coming to South LA, whether there's real resources or not, you have to ask yourselves, are we building a movement or are we doing charity work? Are we really trying to change the equation? So those three lenses are critical to how Community Coalition does its work. So I'm going to tell one quick story about a civic action. On 39th and Western, there's a park. Uh, it's named Martin Luther King Jr. Park. Right? What a name, right? Historic name, like our streets, like our schools. Uh, sometimes our schools with the names uh, of our leaders happen to be the lowest performing schools. Sometimes our streets are the most ridden with crime, and sometimes our park are the most broken down. Well, King Park just five years ago had a rec center filled with asbestos, had no basketball court, no soccer court, uh, had no usage at all. Uh, the people were afraid to use it. Homicides were high around the neighborhood. Uh, and uh, there was an uptick in homelessness and prostitution. That's what the neighborhood looked like. And so what we asked people to do is to come together, look at their neighborhood in, in the King Estates community, ask them, what about this community do you really care about? And what is the most unsafe place for you? And they said they cared about the park, but that the park was also the most unsafe place. And this park is situated uniquely because right, across, right next to the park is an elementary school, a brand new library, the first solar powered library in the city. Across from the solar powered library, which is beautiful, is a liquor store, was a liquor, still is a liquor store, a vacant lot, a recycling center where folks can take their recycling, submit their thing, get the change, go to the liquor store, get their drink. They'd be loitering around the liquor store, and there was a lot of motels, like, uh, you know, we're the motel capital of the world, right? Not five-star motels. These are motels that rent by the hour. And so we had to ask ourselves, if we're about equity, if we're about movement building, if we're about developing leaders and developing power, then how can we approach this differently? And so we started organizing the community. So to answer your question specifically, what is the most important resource South LA has to offer is its people. Its people has the, is the most important resource it has to Amen. offer. Amen. And there is all kinds of policy proposals around focusing on certain places and neighborhoods because they acknowledge that in certain zip codes you have different outcomes than in others, right? This disparity narrative or equity narrative. But the reality is, it doesn't matter how many, I do agree with you, it doesn't matter how many resources you throw at it if you don't build a cultural revolution on the ground and organize people for change. So we organized a community around the park. And we said we wanted to do three things. We wanted to beautify the park, we wanted to invest in the park, and we wanted to bring programming at the park. And so we put pressure on the mayor at the time, and the mayor invested some money. They cleaned up the asbestos, cleaned up the rec center, put in park programming, hired gang intervention workers. We asked for service sweeps versus police sweeps, something to consider, because in the letter that your president sent to all of you and all of the LAPD efforts and all of the, social, all the security efforts that are coming on your campus is great, but what are you doing to provide the services in this permanent place that your school is located in that most of us will probably only be here for five, six, seven, eight, nine years before we go back to our own neighborhoods? 
neighborhoods. So what are the services that we're providing to the homeless folks? What are the services we're providing to the prostitution that's happening on the ground of the sex workers? Uh, we built up a campaign to beautify the parks. We built uh, uh, murals and we did co community cleanups and alley cleanups, which is important for the morale of the community, but that doesn't challenge power like getting the mayor to do something. And then what we also did is we held that liquor store accountable because that liquor store was profiting off of addiction, profiting off of selling alcohol. But we were able to put pressure on that liquor store. That liquor store is no longer called Century Liquor. It's called Century Market. Uh, that owner is now working with us, Mr. Kim. And it raises re human relations issues of how do we get African Americans, Latinos, and Koreans to work together to build up their neighborhood. That liquor store owner, Mr. Kim, is now operating a produce stand. Organic produce every Friday offered to the community and that produce is hand delivered to family members that want it at a price that's much more affordable than what you can get at the Food for Less for rotten meats and rotten produce. Uh, so that's what we try to do in that community. And what have we done? We've been able to eliminate homicides in the neighborhood. We've changed the relationship that the police have. It's not perfect. Police still have problems with the community. Community still got their issues. But we've been able to turn it around. And one thing we do every year to celebrate what we've done at the park, this is five years now in, is we have a concert every summer. And the concert brings 1,500 people out to listen to music. We do education at the concert uh, around political issues, around community issues that they care about. And 1,500 people come out from the neighborhood. And I remember talking to one resident from the community who had his lawn chair out. He looked at me, he's like, hey, come here, you, you, work, you work here? It's like, yeah, yes sir, I do. Uh, he's probably in his 60s, he's like, you know what? I've lived in this neighborhood 25 years and I've never thought of bringing out a lawn chair to listen to jazz on a Saturday afternoon at King Park. So for that one moment, in that blink of history, we were able to transform the condition for that man and for his family. Because people shouldn't have to go all the way to Silver Lake and Echo Park, or go to Made in America, which I was at, so we had a great time, in downtown at Grand Park, to enjoy a great concert. We should be able to enjoy a great concert in our own neighborhood. And that concert needs to be grounded in a foundation of change that we're trying to create in our community. So we're that's gonna, the kind of work that we do. We're gonna move on to can Aaron I, a bit, but can, uh, well, can I park actually, is, oh. Hush, George. No, I'm okay, just kidding. Sarah wants to go, but <laughs> well, no, I just want to build on that. I, I don't want to, I don't want to cut yeah, her off, ahead, but okay, I just. Ahead. But can you name the cross streets of the park again? Just the. Okay. I just want to pick up on, on uh, I don't mean to be so rude. I, I mean, I am, but I'm just, I don't mean to be. Um, uh, I, I just am. I just, they know me. I can't help it. Um, uh, but the, the reason I want to talk is because I, 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 I approve this message. I can verify that this is a true story. Um, but I think also what he's talking about is, um, I don't think you really can understand what that means. Um, I mean, he talks about the man being able to pull out a lawn chair. And when I go up and down Western, I get propositioned for prostitution, even when I'm with my bicycle, because that's, of course, a new form of sex delivery. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I just, it's, it's amazing to me. And that's, and if, if any of you are familiar with the Grim Reaper case, uh, the man who killed, like, or had photos of hundreds of women and possibly killed them, body, like, bodies would be showing up in the, in the alleys on Western. That was his corridor. Those were his stomping grounds. People in that park know that man. And they're like, oh, we always knew, you know, we thought it was weird, but we didn't know. Um, that's the level of disinvestment that there was along that area. And, and people that I interview along that street, they say to me, you know, yeah, it's okay. I mean, it's all good as long as you're in by, you know, 8 o'clock. Everybody knows you got to be off the street by 8 o'clock. Um, and the prostitutes, um, I love them. They, they stand outside the Snooty Fox. They're parked, they're posted up at the, at the entryway, the parking lots. Um, they're all over the place. And so, you know, there's, there's so much that has to happen. But what they've managed to do, I think there's two things that are really powerful. One is when, when we went door to door, I went to door to door with the youth that they um, were doing promotion for, for the event. And having those conversations with the neighbors and hearing how neighbors felt about that park and, and how difficult it is to change perceptions, because even now, it, though it is better, it, it's, it's a different place. Um, perceptions are, people are so used to not having access to their public space that they just, they, they, it's hard to change that mindset that, okay, now I can enjoy this place. So you need organizations that are gonna go and you know, open your door, pull you out, and take you there. But I think the second thing that's really important when he said, you know, our South LA's resources are their people, 
the number one thing for me, the community coalition does and has done amazing things for 20 some years. It's, it's incredible. I've, I've never seen an organization like this, what they do. But the, to me, the most powerful thing that they do is that they instill a belief in the youth that they have a right to that life, to a life, to an education, to a safe space, to all, all the things that, you sh that a lot of us take for granted. And they, they teach these kids to fight for it. And, to, and so you go, you know, teenagers, th th they haven't changed since I was a teenager. They, they hate homework, they hate school, blah, blah. These kids, they come to Community Coalition after school. They're, do they're doing their homework. They're ready to go. They're out knocking doors. They're fighting for their education. They're demanding things. They, they were involved in the willful defiance. Um, getting that legislation passed. These are kids that, from South LA, kids who, most of the kids that I know, because I do a lot of volunteer work with at-risk youth, don't believe they're gonna live past 21. And these are the kids that are gonna change South LA. They're the ones that believe that that place has a future, that they have a future. And that is, that's really what is so powerful about what some of these organizations do. I just wanted to give also Erin a chance yeah, to sorry. comment on some of her views about um, some of the civic action that she's seen in the last uh, few decades as well. Um, I just want to ask a question before I say anything. That is, uh, there are many, many students in here, I know. Of that number, how many of you live in South Central, from South Central, or two, two few? Okay. Um, it's funny, I, 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 you know, I, uh, it's a brilliant presentation. I've always stirred when I hear that. And, and I, what, what, what I hear in, in the discussion is, <clears throat> it's like you said, perception is everything. We're talking about two different worlds almost. Uh, two different worlds. You guys in here, um, I just, we're going to open it up later. But I want to know, what you, you know, how do you see this place? Um, I traverse it all the time. I mean, I went to UCLA, sorry. I did. Um, but I kind of I kind of go between the world of university and where I live, and I feel in a way fortunate because I do, you know, cross a lot of space. But for many people in LA, and, and I would imagine for you as students, you know, what do you think of this place? And this, this assumption of a connection, I think, is kind of premature. I mean, it's a little, something we tend to do, we've been doing since the whole, what I call the diversity movement. We assume diversity. We assume we're all in it together and we work from there. But that's, that's, not, what, that's not reality, and you know this. And we haven't even touched the demographic change in South Central that has really reconfigured things, that has put uh, African Americans in a very tough position. And I'm not hating on anybody or saying it's anybody's fault, but they're in a very, very bad position with no real allies, including allies amongst you know, each other. It's really every man for himself. Um, but I wonder, my, my kind of concern is more existential. You know, what, how did the, how, ultimately you put these places together that aren't even meant to be together. Um, I, I'll just, uh, just say one thing. I live in Inglewood, which people, I call it the South Central of South Bay because <laughs> in a way it's an extension of, it's right next to South Central. And it's also, you know, considered part of, Hoth you know, the South Bay, which is a whole other thing. But, you know, the forum is in Inglewood. The forum, the fabulous forum, which uh, recently got, a, you know, revived. And there's all this talk about it's going to change Inglewood. It's going to make it, I don't know, we're going to just suddenly become shareholders of Madison Square Garden, which owns the forum. But I'm thinking, we have to think about history. We had the forum there for, since the 67. People came in and out, spent money, went to concerts, didn't touch Inglewood. Not really. I don't know. I see, despite the great work that Community Coalition does and other community organizations, they're doing, they're dealing with the outcome of everything. They, you know, as my, I love the story about the park. There are many parks, and there are many, there's that, that bigger infrastructure, that, that investment that hasn't happened. But uh, go, what goes along with that is this perception you're talking about, not just of poor people. We kind of, we kind of um, uh, have, have decided that poor people and black people are the same people. That it's synonymous, not synonymous, but there is a perception problem. Um, I don't think that this new form, which may make a lot of revenue, is not gonna change Inglewood because the perception of Inglewood is not gonna change. And that includes residents of Inglewood who struggle with what do we want. And these are middle class people. But color has a lot to do, and history has a lot to do with, with, with how you perceive yourself now. So there are people who are just glad that it's there and don't expect anything else from that and don't, will not seek out anything else. And so I, um, 
you know, all that goes to political action and involvement, but it first starts with how do you see yourself, and I think you said earlier, what are your values? And what do you want for a community? And that, you know, um, um, that is very much an open question. That's an open question. I, don't, I, I think that's all I'll say right. for now, and, I, and I'll let Francis. That'd be go. great. I, I think one thing you touched on was the revitalization of the forum and so called. I know one of the things uh, we wanted to discuss in this forum is there's definitely this whole move around USC to revitalize the area. And, and the mass Such a loaded word, uh, revitalization. Or, uh, yeah, it, as a kind of revamping and using USC as the so called South LA economic engine for the area. So I wanted to, uh, we wanted to also see, just, and anyone jump in here, just perspectives on what you think about the developments and the, and the p potential impacts of some of that uh, so called uh, uh, revitalization to a point. Is, is it revitalization or gentrification or what do we call it? I mean, it's, 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 it's there, Which dirty word do you a, prefer? There's a, lot of, there's a lot of different, you know, there's a lot of different parts of. And you may uh, want to define your view of, you know, of gentrification. what gentrification is uh, when you, when you, for example, just you know, working in for, where, you're, you, where you guys are at, and, and, you know, Lemert Park is a little west of here, right? Well, Lemert Park, just economically, right? Lemert Park is going through a transformation right now, right, as we know. And Lemert Park, all of a sudden, uh, people who have been living there historically for the last 20 30 years can't afford to live in places like that and partly it's it's your fault I want to say it's 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 the students here who are here uh, who I'm, I'm blaming you directly uh, it, it, the fact that you um, you are um, uh, now you have a, an expo line that goes right and has a stop right in Lamert Park right has created um, a movement of students who, who don't want to pay high rents near USC to, to move to to the west side. And so as you move further west, there's very, very little room for people. So we're having a lot of displacement throughout the city. Uh, people can't afford to live in places like this. So uh, um, so as we expand that way to the west, we're getting people now, the, high, the families that used to live in Lamert Park now are not able to afford living there. So it's changing the face of South Los Angeles in, in certain respects, in certain parts of South LA. But other parts of South LA, don't, I mean, I mean, I see gentrification uh, creeping from central all the way down. Some parts of, 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 um, of what amazingly are changing, transforming, right? So what do we mean by change? I guess that's the question I'm asking, right? What do we mean by change? What, what engine? What, how is USC helping uh, the, that change? If USC is the um, uh, sort of the, that, that lynch, that, that little spark plug, how is USC uh, t allowing people who have lived here, not allowing, but taking into uh, account that those people need to stay here? What kind of a neighbor are you? And that's the question that I guess we could, we could see is, what kind of a neighbor is USC to the population that's been here for a long time? And not, I'm not just talking about um, uh, uh, creating that buffer, as we said, growing that buffer, but I'm saying, how are we uh, really exploring ways so that the people who live here are still enriching the culture in and around USC and not creating more and more, less and less, you know, residents and, and more and more sort of amenities, as we call them, right? Um, me? Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, you can also talk about Unitar. What? Well, um, you can talk about them. I actually want to talk about a couple of things, just picking up on some of the things that Francisco said. There's a, there's a couple of things. When you have, um, when you have a student population, and there's been a lot of pressure on the community for a, a long time in the sense that folks that live in the area report getting notices constantly, calls constantly, do you want to sell your house? Do you want to sell your house? Do you want to sell your house? So, so there's always this pressure on them to, um, to, to turn their properties over. Um, and you also have the landlords feel that pressure as well, or the owners of buildings. And so there's the case of the Roland Curtis building, which is near the uh, expo line uh, stop on Vermont. And that was a place, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. You've, yeah, I'm sure you've been by it a million times. But just a few years ago, the owner who lives in Florida and is a billionaire and does tons of philanthropy um, for other people, uh, let the building fall into terrible disrepair in the hopes that the residents would leave so that he could sell it. And so when they weren't forthcoming, then he would start threatening with sending notices. These are, and these are a lot of folks, a lot of them were on a sec they was Section 8 housing or on assistance. Um, and so that they, these are not folks that are particularly either well-educated or have 
a lot of resources at their disposal to, to find out what things that they're seeing mean. And so they're getting these notices one after the other about you might be evicted or you have to, you know, this has to be done or whatever. And they don't understand what they're reading. They don't know if it's legal. They don't know where to turn. Um, so some of them did start feeling the pressure and started moving out the water service. Um, for a while, they didn't have hot water. Sometimes they didn't have water at all. Um, they, they, the, the owner just let the place run down. He had managers doing weird things it, just to make it uncomfortable so that the building would be turned over, everybody would leave. Um, what had to happen in that case was Trust South LA purchased that building with the help of um, other housing organizations and they're working with the residents. Um, Can you describe what Trust South LA is? Trust South LA is another great organization. It's on uh, Main Street and 41st and they do things around affordable housing. They do organizing in the community. Um, with regards to, to public space. So I've been on a number of events with them where they're trying to get people out into the community on bike rides or something like that. They do uh, just, I think, I'm trying to think what else, the, the, it's mainly housing stuff, I think. that That's what they're best at, is the housing stuff. And they've been, yeah, some of the mobility issues. But the housing is where they really shine. And so that was one of the things that they were doing is organizing residents to, because the building is going to have to come down anyway because of the pressures of the, the rising prices around USC. It's not tenable for, for trust can't recoup the money that it spent to buy the building unless it tears it down, builds something with more units, and brings students in. And so there's this, like, there's this challenge of okay, what balance do we strike? We don't want to push the, the folks that are there out. They but have you, nowhere else to go. But you do. No, no. They want, they want to keep the, they want, to keep them they want the residents to be able to be there, but they also know that they recognize that they need revenue. They need other folks to move in. Um, and so it's, it's this dilemma of like, how do you keep, keep people in place? And then on top of it, the folks that are here, um, I remember I was walking, I was doing a story after the two graduate students were horrifically killed um, on Raymond Street. Um, I was doing a story on, on the increased police activity around the area and how it was affecting the youth that live in the area. And it was so interesting the way, because I was just talking, I interviewed f over 50 youth, uh, Latino and black youth that live in the area. And one of the kids came, I, I approached him and I was just talking to him and he started talking about me to his friend. He was like, yeah, she came up to me and she's just so nice, like she was smiling and she was talking to me and, and they, they, they don't feel that from the USC community essentially. They feel like people are afraid of them. Um, they, they just feel very separate from the community. And so I, I feel like there is that division and then with the, they're, they're receiving the brunt of sort of police activity despite the fact that all of the murderers that are responsible for the activities that have happened around campus have not come from anywhere near this area. And in fact, um, I was talking with one police officer who was describing how he had stopped a gang member from Pacoima on move-in day uh, because that gang member and many others kept calendars, academic calendars of all the schools around the city so that they could go and uh, take advantage of students when they, f they would be most vulnerable to being robbed or whatever it might be. It wasn't, it's not usually the kids from around here. So those two things. Uh, Aaron or Alberto, do you want to jump in? Uh, you know, I'm gonna, we do more than just work in King Estates, but I'm just gonna keep talking about King Estates as it started. Can you hold the mic? What I was thinking was that. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to keep talking about King Estates. We do other neighborhoods, but King Estates surrounding uh, that neighborhood, two Ralphs shut down uh, in the last couple of years. So the organic produce stand was in response to what we call food apartheid. We don't call it food desert because like deserts, uh, are, are in the same way that we think about disparity and equity, uh, Deserts is just kind of a natural condition. Apartheid is a set of policies that get in the way uh, of actually providing food. So when we found out that Trader Joe's was coming, uh, I was super excited, because uh, I can go to Trader Joe's. But it's also a slap to the face of the neighborhood that's been demanding markets with quality produce. The there's a lot of arguments about money and whether people are spending, but at the end of the day, sh 
access to quality food shouldn't be driven by profits. It should be driven by need and how we organize ourselves as a society and as a city. And so there's a lot of policy levers that we can advance to sort of mitigate against that kind of behavior, but it's really hard. And at the end of the day, without having some kind of real people-driven movement to hold our electeds accountable and to hold our banks accountable, hold our everybody, our, co our corporations, the Trader Joe's accountable, how do we win over the white and other communities of color, but I'll focus on the white middle class communities on the west side, to hold Trader Joe's accountable because it benefits the communities on the west side for South LA to get food as well. It's just how do we raise that question? So I, I just think it's absolutely important. We're gonna to continue to organize our community, but we have to really think about equity. And to me, this whole Ralph's question is a big uh, factor in that. With the King Estates work, we asked ourselves, when we change the conditions in King Estates, we're gonna do it in a way that doesn't push people out. We're not doing this to gentrify the neighborhood, we're doing it to build up the neighborhood, and the way to keep it that way is to make sure that the people that are invested in the fight are invested in the fight and are committed to the neighborhood. There is a notion that we do with our youth. Uh, Reggie Corker, who's in the audience, Reggie, please stand up. Please stand up, Reggie. Reggie is a graduate of Fremont High School on the east side. Uh, he went on to University of Michigan, he was a part of our youth program when he was in high school, went on to University of Michigan on a full ride scholarship. <laughs> graduated and came back to the neighborhood. So what we're trying to also do is get our community trained to go and change the economic makeup by not having to import people from outside of the neighborhood. Please move into South LA, we love you here. But how do we also build that out? And I, I do want to acknowledge one other thing uh, I think is important, and I don't know his name, unfortunately, and I should, but the officer sitting next to Larry Aubrey is a leader in the police department Bob Green, so we just acknowledge Bob Green. As much as, thank you. as Detective much Green as, is awesome. yes, as much as I talked about holding the police accountable and making sure that you don't have a bunch of police on your campus, what we do need are folks like Bob Green who understand communities and understand that you can't arrest your way out of certain problems, that you have to build the neighborhood around it. And if there's any message I just wanna, forget that, you know, I see revitalization as opportunities. USC investments, opportunities. How do we leverage that as much as we can to bring about the kind of, because if I think of that as, oh, this is yet another attack, I'll end up never doing anything right. I'll just keep complaining and sit in my little armchair and talk, Bad things about <laughs> but, things. But, but, you but, <laughs> but having folks like Bob Green partnering with uh, the community to change the way the police is interacting with our communities is a, also uh, a big part uh, of the movement. And so I'm going to segue on one last thing. I have to do it because this is a big election in November. Huge. Huge. And on that ballot in November is something called Proposition 47. Raise your hand if you heard of Proposition 47. What Proposition 47 will do is it'll completely change the way we think about criminal justice, not only in California, but across the country. What it will do is it'll take six low-level offenses, minor offenses, possession of, alcohol, uh, possession of narcotics without intent to sell, possession of marijuana without intent to sell, shoplifting, fraud, forgery, uh, for things that are under $950, and turn those felonies into misdemeanors. When we do that, it'll do two things. The first thing it'll do is about 20,000 people in state prison right now that we're spending $60,000 incarcerating them for shoplifting will be released. Not if they have prior violent records, just if they got a clean record and they got caught up in the system, they'll be released because they're on average spending 18 months in jail, $62,000 plus uh, to be there. The second little thing it'll do is it'll be retroactive. There's an estimation about half a million people that have felonies on their records that would be expunged if this passes. So what happens if they don't have that felony on their record anymore? We talked about jobs. They can, because right now, African Americans primarily and Latinos are being 
permanently excluded from the workforce, either by racist practices or by things like uh, felonies on record. So that'll completely change that. They'll be able to get financial aid to go to college. Resources will open up. The money that is saved up to $1.25 billion over the next five years for not incarcerating these folks will then get redirected to treatment, education, and a small percentage will go to victims groups. Does that sound like a good policy to you? It's a great policy. The LA City Council supported it. The LA Times supported it. There's law enforcement leaders that support it. But we need you to support it because at the end of the day, guess what's going to happen a week before the election? There's going to be ads on TV. And it's going to show pictures of folks like uh, Tona, who works in the mayor's office, and who's a leader, and who's from the neighborhood, saying, this guy who's probably never been, obviously never done this, There's someone that looks like Tona is going to be released into your neighborhood and cause havoc in your community. So you see a bunch of ads saying that African Americans and poor folks are going to be released from prison, and it's going to scare a lot of folks. The Willie Horton strategy, right? The strategy they used on Dukakis in the elections. The strategy that they used on, anyway, this is a strategy that's gonna be used. We're gonna need each and every single one of you to get involved, to help pass it. So this Saturday at 9 a.m., come to 81st in Vermont, help us pass this law. We're launching the campaign to get this Paul passed, get money into our schools, and get our community on the right track. All right. Um Definitely go to that. Um, I want to give Aaron one uh, word on this before we are opening uh, up Q&A, so if you have anything to comment on. I've been, just been listening with great interest. <laughs> um, I'll just say a word about what, I, what, to me, what I've seen since, um, since we've moved away from 1992, moved away from really the big idea of justice. And you're right. Martin Luther King said charity is not justice. You know, you give money. Um, it's not the same thing as justice. And I think in a way we live in a post-justice society. We're not focused on justice, at least from black justice. Let's just sort of, let's just, so people have sort of just uh, gone on to, well, let's just deal with what is. What is? Well, what is is <laughs> uh, you still need justice there. But I think um, in uh, South Central people, the, the, the justice movement is taking the form of consumer justice. I want a Trader Joe's, just like they have over in Westchester, just like they have over in, you know, that's, that's equality. And you're right, you know, um, I grumble every time I have to go to Trader Joe's in Westchester, why am I going there? Because the only one, that I have to drive there. And it's full of black people who just, you know, they'll go where they need to go. But, and you're right, this, we finally get one, but it's not ours. It's, it's really catering to you guys, the USC Trader Joe's. <laughs> but, you know, and in Inglewood where, Across the street from the Forum, they are building what's called this Holly, they tore down Hollywood Park racetrack, something I blogged about last week, which I find really <laughs> sad, but and now it's gonna be mixed use development, and the city's very excited. This is, this is gonna transform the city. The mixed use development. And you know what, um, the de the, one of the developers was telling me, we're gonna have a banana republic. Sweet. <laughs> and I, and as if this was gonna change everything. <laughs> And I, you know, and you laugh, but, but, but there is this kind of a, unfortunately, you know, we've, uh, no. <laughs> we, we, we kind of validate ourselves with stuff. Um, I'm in Banana Republic, therefore I'm in a good place. Well, um, I, I, you know, that sounds silly on its face, but I remember when they opened the, uh, the, the, the Starbucks, the first Starbucks to open in Compton, you would have thought it was, you know, opening the Taj Mahal. <laughs> Now there are way, way too many Starbucks, and now they're a virus, and they're everywhere, and they've closed some. Um, and when they opened the Krispy Kreme donut on King and uh, 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 Crenshaw, because that was one of the burnt out lots from 92, there were helicopters. <laughs> and I have a friend who's a developer who called me and said, people, it's a Krispy Kreme. It's not, this is not justice. And so I found myself, yeah, you know, I found myself drifting to this idea that, yeah, you know, just get a Krispy Kreme or a Banana Republic, then we've arrived. But the, the reason people focus on that is because we know there's no real justice coming. We know there's no structure, there's no restructuring, there's no real big investment. You know, after 92, the, remember RLA, Rebuild LA, which became RLA, and then it disappeared. You know, there was this, this, idea, this idea, you know, we need to track big money to South Central. It just never really happened. And so we settle for these things like a Trader Joe's, and I don't mind, you know, I read that Trader Joe's, I live in a food apartheid. <laughs> Um, area. I mean, I can't, I get hit in the face with fast food all the time. Not literally, but you know, you walk out. <laughs> and and um, uh, uh, that's great, but it seems to me working from the bottom up versus from the top 
down, and that is something I think we still struggle with, and that we're just just an ongoing. Just crime. before we get to that, I sure. just I want to jump in just a, a little bit. So I blamed you earlier, but I also want to say to you that you're part of the solution here. Um, I, I blamed you. I blamed you not because you 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 were you, you did it on purpose. It's, it's the conditions, right, of of where we're at, what we're doing. I think uh, I, I think that. Mom and pop shops in this community, right? Who cares about about Trader Joe's? There's an economic development uh, component here that we're ignoring in, in a in a real way. We're ignoring it so much. Investment in South Los Angeles doesn't have to be a big shop, a big you know something that they have at the Grove or that they have in Glendale. We don't need that. South LA doesn't need that. It needs its people, its its community to begin to understand that they have the power. So Alberto said that the the, the biggest asset of South LA is its people. He's right. But how do we tap into that power if most of the people in South LA are af afraid of crime, or afraid to walk, or afraid to play in the streets, or afraid to come out, or afraid to engage, or afraid to uh, come and, and meet uh, with each other, afraid to recreate, right? Organize. Organize, right? So how do we do that? You know, ready? earlier we, we, we talked, earlier Alberto, uh, uh, um, I invited Bob Green here today. Bob Green is Deputy Chief Bob Green, and he is in charge of, uh, of South Bureau. And the way the LAPD is, is organized, they have several bureaus, but this is one of the, you know, the toughest uh, uh, places, right? And what Bob has done is transform South Bureau, right, in, into, uh, into f it's four divisions, so it's four, four, four uh, stations. So you, you, have, you have Southwest, uh, you have 77th, you have Southeast, and then you have the harbor. This guy's in charge of all these men and women who serve there. So he's, he and Charlie Beck talk all the time. What, what he's done, though, in, in the Vermont, Manchester corridor, is he's created an opportunity for this very thing to take root. Right? It is a, a, an authentic partnership between law enforcement and, and community people uh, and stakeholders like Alberto, like the, the folks that you see here, like USC. And, and, and by this authentic approach, we mean that it is about block by block. It is talking about place-based organizing. It is about talking to people, the immigrant community. It is about talking to people that, we, we had, that the LAPD had never dreamed of talking to. And who are the conduits? You're the conduit. You're the people here. You're at this school. This is not a bubble. USC is not a bubble. It is expanding every single day. How you do that expansion, how you touch, how you communicate, how you treat the neighbors that live here around, around this neighborhood is, is going to be indicative of how this university begins to really engage this community so that the people who are here enrich it instead of having them be pushed out. That's what I want to say, that these partnerships are tremendous. The work that's going on here is transformative, and it, and it does have an economic arm to it. And as the conduits, um, we do want to take some Q&A, so um, if folks can line up at the mics, that'd be great. Uh, as, as, and, and while, uh, and Alberto, you can comment as well. Yes, yeah, as, as folks line up, line I just up. want to present, yeah. please come and speak your mind on, I think, asking, answering Aaron's question and a asking your own. But I just want to point out that I actually think that we're on the upswing. I feel very hopeful that things are getting better. Uh, but it's going to take us fighting. So there's an opportunity to raise the minimum wage. Huge. There's also an opportunity to talk about wage theft so that even though it's $15 an hour, everyone gets paid. We have an opportunity to put on the table that when you do hiring, it's not just about local contracts, but that we intensively work to do outreach in the African American community. We have an opportunity to continue to push uh, questions around Prop 47 of criminal justice. We enrolled 6,000 people in healthcare this year because of Obamacare. We've changed the environmental laws at the national level, so we are in a space where we have the opportunity to continue to shift in the other direction, but that could all switch again in 2016 if we don't do our work. 2016 will be when Alberto is running for mayor. And, and this, this side of the room needs well, to somebody. take that yeah, mic, because yeah. I know there's a lot of antsiness over here. I see it. Um, and please, and state your name and, and then your question. And OK, um, my name is Cynthia Gonzalez. And before I ask the question, I actually have to give you some background. I am a lifetime resident of Watts. Uh, went to UCLA She's awesome. Went She's to UCLA. awesome. I went to UCLA for undergrad, USC for my MPH, uh, and just finished a PhD in San Francisco, a really small school um, on social justice. 
Um, Watts. And my lifetime work has been Watts. So the nervousness you see in my body is because of everything that we're talking about right now. Um, so I'll try to be brief, but there's a lot I have to say. Um, Alberto, you mentioned community development in terms of this cultural development and this richness that's in the community as long as as well as placemaking. But we know with that comes an impact of what, our, what it means to begin to entice others to come and live in the community. Um, Aaron, you mentioned that no one wanted to come to Watts or South LA or any areas in the community. Um, and now there's an interest all of a sudden. Uh, born and raised in Watts, born in MLK Hospital, the original one, um, <laughs> right. Um, uh, the, the, the living experiences are very real. Learning how to dodge bullets, learning that you know, uh, survival looks largely different than a lot of my peers at the schools that I attended. Um, and Erin, it's very real. Normalizing our conditions is exactly what Sarah was saying. That when I have friends visit, I tell them park on this side and not on this side because your car's not gonna get um, broken into. That is not a normal life. And people will not understand it if they haven't lived it. Empathy is very different than actually understanding the conditions of the community. Um, and um, Francisco, you mentioned community engagement, community participation. That's one of the largest challenges that I've encountered in my community. Um, because there are structural and institutional inequities that have placed us where we are. Um, Alberto was able to trace some history, but there's so much more be behind that. Um, redlining policies that impacted what, what are now racialized neighborhoods. And we have to consider race and the, con the, um, the ideas of wealth and the analysis of that to begin to talk about the inequities and naming them. Um, you know, uh, the master's tools will not dismantle the master's house, and we are actually in one of the master's houses. Um, and we need to understand that, and we need to name it. And in my experiences at the universities that I attended, a lot of what, what we did in South LA were projects. They were master's thesis. They were uh, a final for a class. Um, I, I went to Community Coalition and analyzed their, their programs and presented in my classes. But there's so much more to it. I witnessed my classmates telling me that South LA was a bastard child of LA. I witnessed my classmates um, walking with me in my neighborhood or wanting to go with me in my neighborhood and being really, really afraid of what it is. And so we have representatives that talk about community engagement, community participation, organizing, but there's these narratives that we need to challenge about what the neighborhood looks like. It's no longer the imaginary of what it is. And I think media plays a large role and that's what we need to critically examine. So at our role as students, as uh, pro producers of knowledge is that, is challenging those dominant narratives because they don't work for us. Finally, there's three phases that I see uh, in South LA, one being the redlining policies that created the racial segregation in the community, two, what Alberto narrated to you, and now three, this language of disparities. Um, I'm the assistant director at the Division of Community Engagement at Charles University and a professor in their Department of Public Health, and we, we do talk about social justice, we talk about disparities, but that's the new, the new wave of what's eradicating our communities. Our communities are getting sick. And it's largely because of what we're talking about. And if we don't examine those structural issues, we're never going to get to the root causes. And you as students and as knowledge uh, producers need to begin to critically think that. And finally, my question is, um, so this whole, I mean, uh, Francisco, you mentioned it, gentrification. And, and Alberto, you mentioned empowerment. And I think those are really, really exotic terms and problematic in so many ways. Um, how is it that, that we do begin to address placemaking, economic development, community development, um, issues of capitalism? We need a South LA, a poor community, so that the West Side can have resources. We need that. That's the way capitalism functions. So how is it that we begin to shift that paradigm? What in place can we think through that? You mean shift away from, gen shift away from gentrification? That's the same issue that we face in Boyle Heights with uh, you have um, gentrification is a really big issue there. You have a, like South LA, you have a, a historic community that has this very strong identity um, and you have 75% renters or more. Um, and so obviously, ensuring people that are, I mean, that's a really huge question. That could be its own panel, gentrification, and, and unpacking that term and what it means and, and how to go around it. But one of the things that I'm working on right now is um, a series of, of stories working both with Lamert Park and, and Boyle Heights to, to get away from that term gentrification because it's not useful to me. 
Um, it just stirs up a lot of passions and a lot of um, racism. <laughs> like it's like the like that's the best way to get people to start like blaming white people or like hating Latinos or whatever it is. It's like the worst word, um, but a very real phenomena. And so unpacking it and looking at, at finding the assets within, looking at who is there that you can rely on, um, who can reach folks, investment in those communities, targeted at the roots. Again, not like in, like the way that Community Coalition is coming at it. I mean, where you are in Watts, like you know Yo Watts is there. Um, what was so fast, if you don't know, Yo Watts is a, it's a, there was a continuation high school in Watts on 103rd near Ted Watkins Park, 103rd and Compton-ish. And um, it's a continuation school. Most of the kids that are there are former gangbangers or, or it's like the last resort. They were all kicked out of school for one reason or another, kicked out of many schools, most of them, um, and never thought they would get their high school degree. And uh, a gentleman who works there as a security guard um, started a bike club, which has never really crossed a lot of folks' mind as the solution to the world's problems. But it, you have to understand, there are no recreational programs. There are no places for kids to go in South LA. Like that's, the recreation is, 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 is a really tough thing. And so, and most kids, especially in an area like Watts where you have 25 gangs within a two mile radius, every single sidewalk is claimed by somebody. You cannot you have, to know, you have to read the walls, you have to know where you're going, you have to know where to park, whatever it is, you have to know where you are at all times. And so this guy, um, Javier Partida, who will be here in the spring to talk, started a bike club. And it gave these kids an access to a world that they had never experienced. In, there was a kid I know that grew up next to the Watts Towers, three blocks from it, never been there in his entire life because he couldn't cross those streets to get there. He had too many beefs built up. So something like that, something small, um, it gave the kids recreation, it gave them a family, it gave them something to belong to that was positive as opposed to negative. And what it allowed them to do was feel motivated, feel like they could, um, feel like they could th begin to think about their future. Now he's lost most of the members in his bike club. I'm almost done. Okay, yeah. he, he, he's lost most of the members of the bike club because they're in college and they have jobs. And so, so it's small things, it can be small, um, but it has to be, it has to be sustained and it has to be really working from the roots up. We'll give Aaron a chance, but I also want to move. Yeah, I just want to say another thing really basic and that is gentrification. I know it's a word you hate, but to me it's just, it's euphemism. It's white people moving in and they're worth more. The property values go up. The people there, they've been struggling all this time and suddenly Trader Joe's magically appears. I'm being, I'm, I'm, over, I'm overstating it to make a point. We don't talk about what gentrification is. There are many people in my neighborhood who would love to be gentrified. We need our property values uh, to go up. So it's, it's, it gets back, it's basic stuff like what, you know, property value, people value, and we all know who's valued over whom. It, you know, let's not pretend that you're absolutely right. Um, and so, you know, but somehow when we have these discussions, white people are out of the equation. They, they're disappeared in these discussions, and we end up talking about what people of color need to do. Well, we need to do a lot. But everybody's in this. There are dynamics on every side, and frankly, you know, the p power structure tends to be white. This is not us. You know, we need to, we need to understand who, who, what, what roles people are playing. Now, a student population is also considered, that's a valuable population, but it's mostly white population, at least the USC. I mean, or not mostly, but, you know, retail, I've learned this over, you know, a little bit about development. They don't come, you're right, it's not just the profit motive, it's the brand, it's the who's, the exclusivity. And it all gets down to real estate, and that's what gentrification is, and we don't talk honestly about it. Or poverty. It's, we, yeah. we don't never talk about poverty. We, we I, don't. I do want to give... Um, actually, I want to talk okay. about poverty. Okay, go ahead, bring it. <laughs> bring it. <laughs> uh, that's I because actually, it's my sister. I, told, I queued her up. Oh, there you go. <laughs> that's right, he did. <laughs> um, and I work in Lemur Park, and I am one of those people that drives the Expo Line, and I love it, because I'm getting to know parts of LA that I didn't know existed before. So that's beautiful. Um, but my question is, since I work in middle school, I work in a um, predominantly African-American and Latino middle school. And so my question is, 
what is the city doing? Because most of the students that I work with lack in resources in terms of parks, in terms of community. Um, parents come to us at the middle school and say, what can my child do on, you know, where can we go? I don't know where your child can go because there's not much that the community offers. So my question to the panelists is, if you have, a que if you have an answer, is um, how, what is the city doing uh, in these small pockets to truly engage our youth? Because our youth, you know, we talk about people maintaining in our communities and we want people to remain in our communities and empower our communities. Well, it begins with the youth and providing programming for the youth. You talked about the King Estates and how can we replicate the King Estates throughout LA? So that's what I want to know is how can the city, the city or what is the city doing to promote engagement at the youth level? For the city I work for the city. Tell us, Francisco. You, you I wanted wanna, a question. I don't want to disparage the city, right? <laughs> I, 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 I want to tell you it? that every single day, right, resources to, to youth engagement are, 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 are being reduced, are being cut. <coughs> social services are being cut from the city. The city has traditionally you know, provided some social services since 92. The city provided more social services. It, it, those social services are going. I think that, that maybe you're getting at a question, Anna, that is, uh, is a, a broader question is, what is the city doing to, uh, to partner with key people, right, to begin to address right, prevention and the engagement of young people in a comprehensive way. Not spotty, not here, not one organization doing a fantastic job and then three uh, miles down the road, it's a desert of engagement and, and no one knows what the hell's going on. Okay, I think that part of our, our work here, part of our advocacy work is that we begin to not only organize, right, but really, I, I, I really am a true believer now of getting to the, to the, so if a community doesn't have a park, so if a community doesn't have youth programming, that we go from, from block to block and we begin to address sort of a groundswell of, of, of organizing so that people can begin to understand that they have the power to then bring those resources to where they need to bring them. Now, uh, is, is the city the answer to that? The city is a strong partner in that. It, it, the city is a leverager of that. Um, so there is no, uh, the, yeah, 15 years ago there was more youth engagement services in the city. I can guarantee you that. Now, not so much, but through maybe a traditional partnerships, we'll, we'll get to a place that, that we feel is more, um, more acceptable. I want to throw it over to Mr. Aubrey. Uh, yeah, my name is Larry Aubrey, and uh, I just have a couple of things to say. I think there's a question on the end of my remarks, but I, I, I'm, I feel like I, did, uh, I don't feel compelled, but I really would like to just make a few comments, if that's okay. Number one, the term racism has come up a few times on this panel. And I think there's a gr gross misunderstanding of that term. Which racism, term, sir? I couldn't hear you. Ra racism is oh. the ability of the governing or majority uh, fashion in, in any city, municipality, in any, any country. It's the ability of, to control people on the basis of race and color. That's racism. Understand that. And Latinos, even though they're the, majority population becoming that in this city. And blacks certainly cannot be racist. You understand what I'm saying? You can be bigoted as all get out, right? But racism is something different. I want you to understand that. When people talk about racism, it's alive and well, okay? It's alive and well. Race matters. There is no question about that. And it can hardly be, uh, it can hardly be overemphasized. But I want to point that out because we slide by some of these things, okay? And I can't help but, but, but focus on some of the things that Aaron said perhaps and and, 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 and uh, uh, Alberto, uh, you know, the whole question of values. Values are at the heart of this problem. Our values these days are individualistic and materialistic. What happened to moral and ethics? Le leadership, leadership accountability. That's at the seat of what we're talking about here. This guy talks about the city levels in the city. The city perpetuates a lot of this crap, okay? The LA city perpetuates a lot of this crap. And so does the institutions in our city, including USC at times. It's not put down, it's a description of reality. You don't want to hear it, I know that, but that's the way it is. You have to take risk. 
for change, real risk for change, okay? I've been in this town since 1942, and it is, and I do call it South Central. It got called South LA at, at City Hall, that's fine. And it's not a big thing, but it's a big thing to me because I grew up here, you see? And I, I, I don't have the answers, I, please understand that. But I know the difference between crap and ice cream, okay? That's, that's how I survive, okay? I have survived that way. I have no organizational backup as such. But I'm in a group called the Black uh, Community Clergy and Labor Alliance, and our, our, our whole thing is to try to get equity, equity at the table. You don't understand, nobody's talking about black heavy. Look, it came up and it was lost in the discussion earlier. Black brown relations are terribly important. Terribly important. You gotta understand. You know, I work for the, I work for the Human Relations Commission, not the city, the county. The, my, the, city, the county started in the early 40s, something else. Let me tell you something, I, and as a matter of fact, I put together the Black Latino Roundtable, and you know who the co-chairs were? Antonio Villaraigosa and Mark Lee Thomas, right? And you know what happened? Nothing. It's not a put down, we worked at it, we tried. It's not a put down. The point is this though, you gotta be honest, you gotta be straightforward and honest. And, and, and when we talk about these things, we can't slide around them, you know what I'm saying? It's very real, I'm telling you right now, black children in this city are at the bottom of the well, faces at the bottom of the well. Okay, that's reality. No, do, you, do you just shout that from the rooftop? No, but that has to be factored in. But it goes to leadership, black leadership as well. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about top to bottom accountability. I work with the police regularly, okay? I was a probation officer myself at one time, right? Do that, but you know, let the police do his job and let us do our job. The rub is that we get a lot of bitching and moaning and a lot of times on the part of people and they're not doing their jobs. That's, it. that's a whole other dynamic. But I'm, I'll, I'll end with this, it's awfully important we're all, we're all, we talk about all being human beings. Yes, but we're, not, we're all not treated as human beings. Dig it? We are all not treated to this day as human beings. Black children are being killed by the public education system. I was a board member myself, a school board member in Inglewood, just next door, all right? I don't wanna go into that, I'm just telling you that. It goes beyond, it goes to race, class is a factor, more and more these days, we know that. But race is very, very important. And I say that because that's where it turns. We had an election in this town just, what, seven weeks ago. McKenna got into the school board. Very important election. Doesn't matter, why? Because of representation there. We had people lobbying to keep that district without representation for eight months for political reasons. It's nonsense, but that's what happens. So what I'm really saying is this. We all have to assume responsibility. And we have to be honest, we have to be honest. I mentioned, I know, and I, I talked about the race thing because it's very important. I, let me just repeat that. Race, racism involves the ability to control people on the base of race or ethnicity. Otherwise, it has no meaning. It has no meaning. You can't be racist if you don't have power, okay? So Latinos right now, my view, right? Particularly LAUSD, right? They don't have the power, right? Because they don't have that, they don't, they, they, they don't can't be racist, that's what I'm trying to say. So anyway. This is a very important discussion. I wanted to add to it my, my, my little bit, and I don't have any solutions, as I said, but I do, I do, I do know that the difference between, not, I'll clean it up and say form and substance. So what I'm saying is keep on keeping on, but I think this, it's, we've got to look at things in, in terms of uh, what it really is. We, there are systemic factors that have to be mentioned here. Every time you talk about community coalition, I work with the community coalition regularly, but the community coalition, by and large, did not deal with black issues up front. That wasn't their charge. I mean, that's not your charge. This is the charge of my people to do that, okay? That's a multicultural group, and I, I, I was a human relations consultant, right? But I always dealt primarily with the black thing. Why, right? I'll just end on this. A friend of mine who passed some time ago, his name is Cy Rich. And he come home from ball games in New York. He's from New York, you know, in New York. A Jew, Jewish fellow from New York, right? So he gets home at night, and he tells him from the ball game, and he tells his uncle sitting there, Hey, the Yankees did this, and Brooklyn did this. And the uncle says, I, what does it mean to the Jews? What does it mean for the Jews? And I'm saying, my, my, my position is, what does it mean for not only all of us? What does it mean for blacks? But what does it mean for all of us? What does this discussion really mean, okay? And it does not mean a program here and a program there, right? It means substantively and sustainability. That's the key word, sustainability. My people have out, episodic outrage. Trayvon Martin is a faded memory in this town. Do you understand that? That's, that's almost tragic. Anyway, let me stop. Thanks for the time. I want to say one word, uh, two, three, thank you, Larry. Three sentences, sort of. One, uh, 
I thought, it's, not, it's a long sentence, quick sentence. <laughs> when Obama was elected, it instigated the Tea Party. And when Ferguson happened, I thought it was a moral test on our country on whether it was gonna instigate a real movement for racial justice. And it hasn't, unfortunately. And it hasn't. And we have to get to the place where situations like Ferguson, which should never happen in the first place, really speaks to our moral conscience as a country. And when I see those young people out there saying no justice, no peace, and interrupting every single Philharmonic event, every single St. Louis Cardinals event, making people feel uncomfortable, I think it's important because at some point, we need to have our Tea Party moment, and it hasn't arrived. And so I just hope we can build that together. One really quick thing, and um, let's continue this discussion up front, uh, up in the second floor patio at the reception. It's 7.50, we may, went may, 20 minutes over, so. Uh, may I just make a, a quick comment? I, um, I was waiting in line, I would appreciate it. Uh, I, if it's quick. <laughs> look, okay, and I don't want to sound like a broken record. I know people <laughs> waited up here. I, I think, and partly goes to the comment of the lady in, in the middle and what the gentleman said. Um, you, you know, uh, Alberto, is it? Uh, he mentioned he's not afraid of, um, uh, I think it was uh, revitalization. I, I get scared when I hear revitalization because I know what's coming. And James Baldwin called it Negro removal. And he called it that for a reason. And let's be frank, I went to USC. I'm a graduate of USC. I was born and raised in South Central, came back after law school to South Central, wanted to do something for this community. And we see these projects now moving south of the 10 and east of the one, and west of the 110 where they never did before. And I have a lot of white friends. I love my white brothers and sisters, but we have to be frank. What he, the gentleman mentioned is we have to have a frank discussion about race because it's the undercurrent in all of this. And I heard three things here earlier uh, to, some, to different degrees. Alberto mentioned it. I'm not afraid of revitalization. Race is tied in whether we want it or not. Because what happens is my white brothers and sisters who can afford it, they move in and someone moves out. Uh, the second lady mentioned it. She said it as honestly, I think, as I would say it. And thirdly, the, the, the third lady, um, I think, she, I believe you live in Boyle Heights based on your comment. And I, I actually do take offense that said that there's racism, it brings those issues of racism. I don't see how they can bring those issues of racism to you because you're moving into a neighborhood and I don't know your specific situation, but when I see that happen in Eagle Rock, No, no, I Highland was referring Park, to the discussion that it generates, not the process itself. Sure, but the racism the discussion, the racist issues, I think are the other way around. And I'm telling you because I've had these discussions with my bro white brothers and sisters, Silver Lake, Echo Park is coming into South Central, it's in Boyle Heights. But that's just, the, that's just the fact. And we have to start from that foundation and say that you are, in one sense, part of the problem. And maybe you're fine with that. And maybe people are fine with that. But at, that is the truth at the bottom of all of this. Okay. In USC, for example, I live not too I'm far sorry, from I'm here. I'm sorry, Let me just I, say one, one final thing, I promise, well, one I mean, minute. You said you wanted to go quick, so let's go. I remember with this neighborhood, I do want to between here and the road. Also, I also want to know if that was directed at me, if, I'm seeing, if you're, if you're or, accusing no, me no. of a gentrifier. I, I don't know who you are. I'm not directing yeah, it at you. Continue. Yeah. yeah. Please Fine. go up to the second floor, please. <laughs> Earl's Grill is upstairs. And thank you to the panelists again for um, great.